Okay, so situation normal, everything must change. Um, what I'm going to talk about is um, the origin of my uh, work on maps. I'm going to talk about um, what is a map, and, and then I'm going to talk about some patterns and use those patterns to explain uh, changes that have been going on in terms of cloud, in terms of serverless, and the upcoming changes in terms of um, computational so I better start, well, obviously at the beginning. Um, so this is a, a place I used to work at back in 2000, oh gosh, 2003, 2004. Uh, it was a company called Fatango, online photo service, uh, very popular. Well, it, it small scale compared to today's giants, um, um, but it had a problem. Uh, it, it was growing, it was profitable, um, but the problem was the, the CEO. The CEO was completely and utterly uh, clueless. I uh, didn't have any idea what they were doing, just making up as they went along. And I know this uh, because I was the CEO. I, I used to um, create all these sorts of wonderful uh, vision statements. Uh, our strategy is customer focus. We will lead an innovative effort in the market through our use of agile techniques and open source. This is us back in 2003, uh, being heavy users of uh, extreme programming, uh, which is a technique created by a friend of mine, Kent Beck. Um, but the thing is, I'd pinched this from another company, just changed a few words. So I used to go around recording other tech execs talking about strategy. I used to listen for the common words. I called them business level abstractions of a healthy strategy or blast for short. Um, and I'll give you a list. Uh, um, this was, uh, I've done this uh, several years uh, over time. Uh, so this is one year, digital business, big data, disruptive, innovative, collaborative, competitive, Advantage, ecosystem, open source, blah, blah, blah. Um, I mean, if you did today, people would, uh, they're bound to put AI, large language models, chat GPT, something along those lines. So what I also did was I grabbed a whole bunch of companies, different vision statements, and I created what I called the blah template. Our strategy is blah. We will lead a blah effort of the market through our use of blah and blah to build a blah. And then I just slammed them together. The blahs and the blah templates to also generate uh, at random, some some strategies, like our strategy is customer focus. We will lead a disruptive effort of the market through our use of, I can barely say the words, it's that painful. Um, or our strategy is innovative digital business. We will lead a growth effort of the market through our use of customer focus. Oh, it's just dreadful. Nonsense. Total nonsense. Uh, but I, I would send them around. And the last time I did this, I got about 400 responses of three basic types. Uh, this is the exact wording from our business plan. I've seen two of these used already. And my, my personal favorite was, are you for hire? Um, so I hadn't got a clue what I was doing when I was running this company. And uh, I sort of started to sus suspect other people didn't have a clue either. Um, you can actually, this is all, I'm just going to take my camera off because uh, it just covers up some of the slides. So give me a second. Hang on. There we are. Um, a friend of mine's actually put this all on GitHub, um, created a, a service. If you ever need a strategy, just type in the URL. It will automatically, you know, magically create you one based upon nothing whatsoever. Um, I think it's down at the moment, but don't worry. You can just uh, you can do the same by just asking ChatGPT. I have a vision of becoming a leading provider of mesh networks in rural farms. I don't really. Um, just give me a vision and a statement. It does a pretty good job. Um, you know, we will achieve our vision by focusing on the unique needs of rural farms, leveraging cutting edge. Oh, it's just just total nonsense. Anyway, um, so. Um, you know, there I was, um, uh, CEO of this company making this stuff up. Didn't have a clue what I was doing. I mean, today, I mean, it's even worse. Chat GPT can do the job that I was doing. I mean, people will say, you know, are worried about, you know, is Chat GPT going to replace your CEO? Well, don't worry. Um, uh, we can use them as co workers, according to the World Economic Forum. Uh, you still need the CEO. Uh, to give you, you know, sensible advice like how earlobes can signify leadership potential, uh, which is probably my favorite business article written by Harvard Business Review. Um, the size of your earlobes matter in terms of strategic potential. Uh, to my second favorite is uh, Marcus Fitz's work, which basically demonstrates that CEO impact on firm performance is mostly due to chance. So it doesn't have any impact at all. You may as well just get anybody to do the job. 
except for we now know that actually if you put an AI as your chief executive, it seems uh, this is the case of uh, NetDragon in China. Uh, they're currently outperforming uh, the market uh, by having um, uh, got rid of their CEO and just replaced them with an AI. Um, so there I was. Realizing I was the fake CEO, and I'm, I'm quite convinced others are in that boat as well. And so I would read every single book I could find on strategy in a sort of desperate attempt to understand what it was I was supposed to be doing. And I, to be blunt, I was getting nowhere. And then I ended up in a bookshop in London, and the bookseller said, have you ever read The Art of War by Sun Tzu? And I hadn't. So I, I, I bought a, uh, several copies of the book because they're all translations, so different versions. And it was in reading the second version, I noticed a particular pattern. So Sun Tzu talked about five factors that mattered in competition. Have a purpose, a moral imperative to do something. Understand your landscape. Understand the climactic patterns, that's like the weather, so how the landscape is changing. Understand doctrine, principles of organization. And then you're into leadership and gameplay. And this overlap with something else I'd come across, which is John Boyd's OODA loop. Um, John Boyd, a US Air Force pilot, the OODA loop stands for, well, the first O is observe, and that's what landscape and climatic patterns are about. You understand uh, the space and how it's changing. Then you orientate yourself around the space. That's what principles are about. Then you decide where you're going to attack, and then you act. And that's what leadership is about. So these fitted very nicely and at the heart of this was this question of why. And in fact, there are two whys. The why of purpose, my moral imperative to do something, and the why of movement. Do I make this move over that move? So think of it like chess. Uh, my why of purpose might be to win the game or maybe to lose the game if I'm encouraging somebody else. The why of movement is do I move that piece or this piece? And so... At that point, I sort of felt I sort of had an understanding of what was going on. Um, but, you know, I kept on looking at this and thinking, well, landscape. How do I actually understand the landscape that I'm operating in? And this brought me into the subject of maps, because I started to look at military history. And, uh, you know, this is one of my favorite battles, uh, the Battle of Thermopylae. So Themistocles, ancient politician, Greek general, had a problem the Persians were invading, decided to block off the Straits of Artemisia and force the Persians along a coastal road into Thermopylae. It's a narrow pass. Uh, where a smaller army could defend against a larger force. So about 140 to 170,000 Persians, about 4,000 Greeks, um, including 300 Spartans. And this is where we get the story of the 300 from. And I was looking at this map and thinking, well, this is a great way of different groups communicating about a space and discussing what to do. So how do I do this in my business? Well, in my business, I use something called SWOT diagrams. So I decided to write a SWAT for the battle. Uh, strengths a well-trained Spartan army, a high level of motivation not to become a Persian slave. Uh, weaknesses, the E4s might stop the Spartans turning up, a truckload of Persians are turning up. Opportunities, get rid of the Persians. Uh, get rid of the Spartans, we're Athenian. We actually hate the Spartans. Uh, threats, the Persians get rid of us, and the Oracle says a really dodgy film might be produced a few thousand years later. So I, I simply put those next to each other. And I asked myself the question, what would you use to communicate and determine strategy and battle, position and movement described on a map, or some sort of magic framework like a SWOT diagram? And it, I realized I was using these magic frameworks. So it was at this point, in about 2005, I, I, I became right. I've got to start um, using maps, maps of my competitive environment. So where do I start? Well, the first thing I did is I got everybody in the business to send me all the maps they had. And they sent me loads. Um, I had business process maps. I had mind maps. Um, I had uh, customer journey style maps. I had uh, systems maps. And I took one of these maps, and this happens to be the online photo service, and I had to look at it, and I took one component, CRM, customer relationship management, and I simply moved it across um, the map and ask the question, how has it changed? And the answer is, it hasn't. 
Now, that's really odd because if I take a geographic map and I move Australia and put it next to the UK, that's definitely changed that map. So why hasn't this changed? Well, it's not a map, it's a graph. And that's the one thing all the maps that I had had in common. None of them were actually maps. They are all graphs. Business process maps are actually business process graphs. Mind maps are mind graphs. So to understand the distinction, uh, these three images um, are all graphs and they're all identical. Nottingham, London, Dover, three places connected by two, two roads, the M1, M2. Uh, they're all identical. These three images at the bottom are all maps and they are completely different. The difference between a map and a graph is that in a map, space has meaning, uh, which is why they're very good for understanding landscapes, whether it's territorial landscapes or economics landscapes or, you know, even the landscape of software. So I thought, right, okay, well, what, what gives space meaning? Well, it turns out that a map needs three basic characteristics. You need an anchor, such as magnetic north. You need the position of pieces, so this is north, south, east, or west of that. And you need consistency of movement. So if I'm going north, I'm going north. If I'm going south, I'm going south. So I thought, right, let's apply this to a business. So I applied it first to my business, but I, I always use a, an example, which I call uh, off the tea shop. The first thing we're going to have to decide is what are the anchors? Um, they also help set the perspective of the particular map. So in this case, I'm going to t take two anchors. I'm going to take the business selling cups of tea and the public who hopefully consume cups of tea. They both have a need through the cup of tea. One is to, to get refreshment. Um, so each of the lines are actually exchanges of capital. I give you money, you give me a cup of tea. The business, I put investment, I get return investment. Okay, so I've got anchors connected through a need, a cup of tea. But that cup of tea has needs. It needs tea, it needs hot water. Uh, hot water needs cold water, it needs a kettle. Kettle needs power. So what I've got is a chain of needs. Now, when we talk about, uh, we give different terms for this. Uh, when we are looking within a business, we call it a value chain. Uh, within that value chain, there can be components which are supply chains. And of course, the value chain of a particular business can be part of the supply chain of an entire industry. There are all chains. Uh, the, the only difference is, is where we set the boundaries of who's consuming. So this is a graph. Uh, it's got anchor and position described through a chain of needs, but I'm still missing movement. But it turns out all of these are forms of capital and they're all evolving through a common pattern. So you start off with the genesis of novel and new items and the same thing will evolve over time. You'll get custom built examples. Eventually you get product and rental services and eventually commodity and utility services. So if I simply take my graph, and now I just ask how evolved each of these components are, now I have a map. I have uh, an anchor position of movement. Now, the point about this map is I can look at it, I can look at the assumptions being made, and I can question and challenge the assumptions. When we normally show this, uh, we normally put you know, uh, the evolution axis at the bottom, uh, we, we, we turn that into an axis and just a dotted line to refer to the fact that it is a chain of needs. Anyway, I might go, uh, why have we got kettle and custom built? Surely that's, a, that's more of a product or at least a commodity. One of the things that I found in business is we tend to run the business with graphs, magic frameworks and stories. And stories are particularly problematic. Uh, we have an entire industry uh, which spends its time telling everybody to be a great leader, you've got to be a great storyteller. And so when you challenge somebody's story, you're actually challenging the person. Uh, this is why people get very defensive about this. One of the beauties about putting it in a mapping form is I can take a story, put it into a map, and ask questions about the map. So I'm not challenging the person and their story, I'm just saying there's something wrong with the map. So I'll give you an example uh, this is an insurance company. Uh, this is a business, well, it's a process flow diagram that they had. It's a graph. 
They need compute, order server, server goes into goods in, modify mount bracket. Uh, they had a bottleneck, uh, this is back in 2010-11, to do with modifying and mounting servers. They'd come up with a plan to invest in robotics. They'd gone through a whole bunch of vendors. They'd spent six months working on this, put together a beautiful return on investment calculation with the investment needed, many, many millions, and how much it was going to save in terms of uh, speeding up the process, reducing failures, etc. And they asked me to have a look at it. But the problem is they've already built the story. So if you challenge the story, why do we need robots? Then it's going to be very defensive. So I simply said, can we map it? And they were like, oh, I'm not sure about that. Um, it took 10, 15 minutes, uh, and they managed to produce a map. And this is their map. User needs compute. I remember, you know, we'd say compute was more of a commodity. I'd argue it would be even back then. Um, order server, server goods in, rack mount modify. Now, just looking at the map, I was able to ask a question. Why have you got rack in custom built? And it turned out they had custom built racks. They'd actually had their racks made for them. So what are the modifications you're having to do to servers? Well, our servers don't fit our racks, so we have to take cases off, draw new holes, add new plates. Ah, and that's the bit that's causing failure and slowing the process down. That's why you need robotics. Okay. It was only a few minutes later that somebody said, why don't we use standard racks? Now, these people weren't daft. They were simply trapped by past stories and past narrative. At some point, it had made sense to use custom-built racks, and they'd missed the whole process of it being industrialized. And so what they were doing is they were optimizing process flow, which would say go and spend money on robotics to improve the process, rather than actually looking at what they were doing and going, hang on a minute, we shouldn't be doing this at all. Now, um, these sorts of maps are being used to put up uh, uh, satellites in space, uh, NASA planet, to save hundreds of millions, if not billions, across government. It's always quite amazing how, how many people don't understand their users, their user needs, the components involved, how evolved those components are, and, and then they go and uh, optimize process flow rather than looking at the map and seeing what should be evolved. Um, but this also, now you understand a landscape, we start to learn patterns. And there are three basic types, the climatic patterns, the, the uh, uh, sort of doctrine patterns, and the uh, leadership patterns. But I thought I'd introduce them with um, an example. So this is HS2, high-speed rail, big heavy engineering project, UK government. Uh, James Finlay uh, used to be the CIO. Now, James had a problem. Uh, they needed to build the entire railway in a virtual world. Um, and the reason for doing this is it's easier to dig up a virtual world and go, whoops, we've got it wrong. Oh, it's less costly, hopefully, hopefully, than digging up the actual countryside. So this is um, their plan, their, their, their systems graph for building HS2 in a virtual world. And James's problem was how do I manage this? So normally what would happen is we'd break it into uh, small lots, uh, small contracts, which were sounded similar, like user experience or engineering or infrastructure, and then we'd outsource them. And inv invariably this caused massive cost overruns and failures within government. So James uh, spent a Sunday afternoon, sat down, had a cup of tea uh, and mapped it out. Uh, he's an old friend of mine. I taught him to map a long time ago. And so he sent me the map. Uh, this was back in 2012. And simply asked, how do you manage this? Now, this was quite easy for me. It's quite easy for me because all the components are evolving from left to right. They're going from this uncharted space, the uncertain, unpredictable, becoming more industrialized. And the techniques that you use vary accordingly. So what we'd learned back in oh, 2005, 2006 is extreme programming, agile development was very good on the left-hand side of the map because it reduced the cost of change, whereas lean off the shelf was very good. So Scrum, you know, um, MVP, all this sort of stuff, very good in the middle. It's all about learning, reducing waste and Six Sigma outsourcing, very good on the right-hand side because it's all about reducing deviation. 
Uh, so you just simply use appropriate methods. So that's exactly what they did in 2012. This project ended up in front of the Public Accounts Committee because it was delivered way ahead of schedule and under budget. Um, so literally, the left-hand side uh, built in-house agile techniques, off-the-shelf products in the middle, outsourced the stuff on the right. There's a world of difference between using agile, as in using extreme programming, and of course, being agile. Being agile requires you to use appropriate methods, including Six Sigma where it's appropriate. Um, the problem is, you know, if you go to a conference and say neither Agile or Six Sigma works everywhere, uh, depending on the conference, you know, it's normally Burnham heretic. Um, let's have a look at what normally would happen uh, if we take Lot 1 Engineering, which they would have outsourced, overlay it onto the map. I can tell you that contract's going to fail before we've even signed the paperwork. And it's going to fail because the stuff on the right-hand side can be defined in a contract and will be efficiently treated, but the stuff on the left-hand side, and there's sort of more in the uncharted space, we're still learning about. So you can never actually define it in a contract. It's always going to incur excessive change control costs if you do. Um, that's one set of patterns, use appropriate methods, uh, which basically we learn from doing what we call pre-mortem, post-mortem uh, uh, challenge. So pre-mortem challenge is where we look at what we're going to do and we'll challenge it on the map. Why are we custom building stuff which should be a commodity? Post-mortem learning is where after we've done the project, we come back and look at the map and then we look at what changed. And that's the process where we start to discover patterns. You know, this method doesn't work everywhere, for example. Um, I would say that most organizations not only don't understand the users, the user needs, the components involved, um, the, the supply chain of all of these components, um, they often focus on process efficiency when they shouldn't do. Uh, and they need to evolve the components. They, they use mixed uh, methods uh, or sorry, they don't use, they try to use single size methods inappropriately. And most contract structures I see are flawed. I'm always surprised anything ever gets delivered. Um, as I said, there are, uh, that's one, um, there are about 30 climactic patterns, about 40 patterns you learn in doctrine. There's about 110 different forms of gameplay as well. And most people are oblivious to all of this. So I'm going to talk about some of the climactic patterns, and I'm going to use computing history as an example. So let's go all the way back to things like, oh, uh, uh, Colossus, or the Z3. Uh, that was 1943, the Z3, actually. So in the early days of computing, user, you want an application, uh, all the compute was custom built, and your application was literally written in the wires that you would plug in here and there. Um, then we get started to get systems like Lions Electronic Office, uh, and that introduced concepts like operating system. And then we'd start to get uh, these components were all involving. We get things like uh, the IBM 650. So now we've got computers of product. We're starting to get emerging architectural practices. It's not just physical things that evolve, but practices, data, knowledge, even ethical values do. Um, you know, it's all slowly moving across the map. Uh, and then we'd start getting sort of runtime environments like Java. So, you know, application, emerging coding practice, runtime operating system, good architectural practice. You know, it was, uh, it's uh, started off as emerging, became good for computers of product. And you just keep on going. You end up about 2005. That's roughly where we were. And then 2006, um, compute evolved to more of a utility. And that's one of the patterns you learn. If there's supply and demand competition, this doesn't stop everything. It keeps on moving from the left to right. Uh, so it's uh, the launch of AWS uh, EC2. Uh, obviously, we had uh, S3 and simple messaging service as well just beforehand. Um, but, you know, compute itself had, it had changed. It had gone from uh, compute as a product to more of a utility. Of course, um, lots of people are built with computers of product and around the concept of computers of product. So um, they had lots of success, lots of data centers, lots of investment. Uh, that always creates inertia to change, by the way. So always worth remembering. But the other pattern you see is what we call co-evolution of practice. So whenever we shift from, say, product to utility, uh, 
because the fundamental characteristics of the thing change. In this case, we go from what's known as high mean time to recovery, takes weeks or months to get a new machine, to low mean time to recovery, it takes seconds. The actual architectural practices change. So we went from um, capacity planning, M plus one, um, disaster recovery test to distributed systems, design for failure, chaos engines. Um, so you get a new set of emerging practices. We didn't know what it was going to be called at the time. Uh, those new sets of practices, the more utility form enables new things to appear. Those new things we call the adjacent unexplored, and they create new sources of economic value and worth. And these are basic standard patterns you can apply to, to a map. Now, because of this, if you're in competition with others and somebody's adapted to this world, they get new value, speed, efficiency, they create pressure on everybody else to adapt. As more adapt, uh, that pressure mounts. So that leads to another pattern, which is you have no choice over evolution. It's a bit like cloud. You, you never had a choice over cloud. It was never a question of uh, uh, if. It was only ever a question of when. And of course, CEOs started to pick up on this and make my stuff cloudy. Um, uh, people would take their existing systems without re-architecting, putting them onto cloud. Amazon would have an outage. They'd run around screaming, the end of cloud is nigh. Uh, you'd say, shouldn't our architecture evolve as well? Uh, burn him heretic, yeah, usual nonsense. Um, People really missed, uh, so back in 2006, six seven, they really sort of didn't get to grips with this emerging practice until, of course, Andy and Patrick gave it a name. Uh, I can't remember what it was, 2008, 2009, they called it DevOps. Um, for myself, I, I was running strategy for a company called Canonical. They provide Ubuntu, and uh, we actually mapped the space out in 2008, used the maps to basically say, look, we know cloud is uh, slightly more complicated than this. Uh, we, we know cloud is going to stay. We know we're going to get a new emerging practice. We don't know what it's going to be called, but something, so keep an eye on it. We're going to have new things being built. So that's where we focused our investments, and we also used the map to work out where not to invest. Now, Ubuntu, we were 2 to 3% of the operating system market against Red Hat and Microsoft. Um, in 2008, uh, it cost half a million to 18 months. Uh, we went from 2 to 3 to 70% of all cloud computing. So if you were involved in cloud and you suddenly, uh, back then, and suddenly it was Ubuntu was everywhere, uh, you were mapped, just to, just to tell you. Okay. Um, of course, the emerging practice evolved uh, and get, got a name, DevOps. Um, so DevOps have become quite established by 2010. Uh, the old architectural practice, best architectural practice for computers, a product, got a new name of legacy. 2014, the runtime started to shift. So this is rather than, you know, lamp.net, um, shift to more of a utility with things like um, Lambda. And we see exactly the same thing. Efficiency, a new emerging practice eventually got a name, FinOps, uh, new things being built on top. And that's another pattern you learn is that strategy is iterative. Um, you know, where you would play the game in 2008, uh, you'd obviously focus on the new emerging practice, eventually got the name DevOps, great. You'd uh, focus on the shift to utility of compute, great. Uh, by 2016, it's completely different. I mean, if you are infrastructure as a service cloud, DevOps is heading towards the new legacy. I mean, you would be focused more on 2016 on serverless and the emerging practice, uh, which I mentioned got the name FinOps. Uh, there's a wonderful book recently published, uh, The Flywheel Effect uh, by Dave Anderson. It's all about the, uh, the shift of uh, a very old insurance company to a serverless world. Um, lots of examples, lots of maps. Uh, there you are, plug. I'll recommend David's book. All right, so we move on to 2018. I'm going to just shift some of the map. I know because, you know, I'm, I'm not particularly interested in below the code level. Um, so all the infrastructure containers, um, Kubernetes, and all the rest of it, increasingly invisible. Increasingly, I hope it's completely extracted away from me. I, I never want to have to build another server again. Uh, so you've got the serverless space, FinOps. Uh, you've got the code environment application. That's where we're going to concentrate. Uh, one thing we noticed is large language models, um, uh, you know, starting to make this journey of industrialization. 
And so an idea was born that somehow you'd combine FinOps and uh, those sort of practices of using components in large language models to create a sort of conversational programming environment. So I explained this all to a friend of mine, and he presented at AWS reInvent. Uh, this is Jarvis. So this is basically a large language model uh, against a whole bunch of Amazon a uh, APIs. And it's a system which enabled he taught to basically uh, develop uh, applications. Uh, in this case, not using text, but actually using conversation. It's uh, well, voice-based conversation rather than text-based conversation. So we could literally have a conversation with it and it would develop and deploy and build entire applications uh, for him. So this is Alexander. Um, uh, this is just a, a, a basic description of how the system actually worked. Um, 2022, we're seeing more of that now. Uh, language, large, large language models continue to evolve. We're now seeing things like Copilot, etc. Um, there's an issue, though. A lot of them uh, seem to be tied to a runtime environment, so they're very much uh, tied to the language. <laughs> So we're, we're using uh, these tools to uh, you know, look at my code, instruct me, tell me how the code is better rather than actually a conversation. So, so it's, it's more, um, you know, I, I think Copilot and all this sort of stuff is great. But if you go back to the um, uh, Alexander uh, system of 2018, it, it's much more closer to what... Uh, um, uh, Nicholas uh, Negropont described, and I'll come to that because I, I suspect this is where we're going to go. Um, what we're going to see is that combination of large language models, FinOps, and conversational programming built around combining services, not so much about the, the language itself. And out of this, we'll get sort of the emerging practices, uh, which we're, we're starting to see with uh, prompt insertion, injection, and engineering. So, just uh, the origin of this is graphic conversation theory. So, uh, Nicholas Negropont, um, it was talking about um, when developing a system, it's actually a conversation uh, between different perspectives, um, and um, which are in the minds of several designers. And the thing to realize is the machine and the human are both equal designers. So, it, it, it's not a... Um, uh, or an instruction relationship where I tell you to do something or you tell me to do something, which is where a lot where we're going with a lot of these large language models in terms of the coding environment. It's much more a conversation of stitching together services working, but we've got to find a language in which to do that. So I think actually World Economic Forum, um, despite me teasing dreadfully at the beginning, is, is probably right. I mean. Um, a lot of CEOs are probably quite safe from their AI counterparts um, as long as they use them as co-workers. But we've got to find the right medium in which to talk. And I suspect the medium is something like a map. So going back to Nicholas Negra upon that graphical interface, uh, and this, by the way, is a map built by city planners from all different parts of the world covering uh, coherent city transport, what it actually looks like. Um, we need to get away from that sort of text-based analysis. I think that is um, uh, the past way. Uh, and we're moving much more to this sort of um, a different language, a different model described about the interconnections of services. So I wanted to talk to you about the um, origin of where I got into maps. And I wanted to talk to you about what a map is and um, how you know you can use them to solve very very simple problems like for example uh, people custom building things which should be a commodity by misapplication of uh, methods uh, um, agile works here six sigma works here to to why contracts are flawed so you can use them to look at how um, uh, industries are, are changing and you can use them to anticipate change in the same way we did with Ubuntu. So we knew the whole change of practice was coming before DevOps had the name of DevOps. And you could do the same with serverless as well. And I expect the same is going to be true with conversational programming. I mean, I think we're in the Sun Cloud moment. Um, Sun Cloud, by the way, for those who didn't know, was the precursor uh, before the cloud. It, it didn't go anywhere in the end. Um, I think we're more in that 
mode. I think the abstraction layer for which we're building systems, because we're often falling back into text, because that's what large, large language models are good at. We are missing uh, that that componentization, those connection of components, that language to describe that. And I think that's actually going to be where it gets interesting. Um, right now, though, of course, the focus is like serverless. And of course, it's likely that those models are going to come out of the you know, systems like Lambda because it has that data for the interconnection of services. Um, but these are just some of the patterns. As I say, they, all of this stuff is Creative Commons. It's been used from saving huge amounts of money in government to sexual health campaigns uh, in different parts of the world to putting satellites up into space. Uh, they're all imperfect representations of a landscape. All maps are. There's no such thing as the perfect map of France. Um, uh, if there was, it would be one-to-one uh, -one scale the size of France, and it would therefore be useless as a, a map, as a representation. So they're all imperfect. They're all models, so they're all wrong as well, uh, but they tend to be uh, useful. Now, at that point, I think I've got about two or three minutes left. I'm burnt all the time. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, there's some big issues about sovereignty, but I won't get into that. Was there any questions? You can finish, yes, Simon, if you like. Sovereignty? Oh, gosh. Okay. Hang on a second. Um, okay. Very, very quickly. Leadership. Um, there are many, many patterns in leadership. Uh, there's about 110. One of my favorite is a particular pattern called ILC, where you industrialize components to a utility, expose it through an API, other people build on top, you mine the metadata to spot what's becoming popular, industrialize it to a new component service. So you go EC2, people do big data, you come out with Elastic Map Reduce, you've just chewed up somebody's business model, they go, well, you've chewed up my business model uh, at your yearly conference and everybody else cheers because you've now provided them new component services. And it's a very simple model. Uh, you get everybody else to innovate for you. Uh, you mine the metadata to spot future success. Uh, you commoditize components. So you concentrate on basically doing, uh, uh, as you grow the ecosystem, then your know, rate of innovation, customer focus, efficiency, all increase. So, you know, remember the old Porter, you could do one of those three. That was broken in 2006, easy to bust. Um, and so you just climb up the, um, uh, the chain, compute machine learning engines, machine learning platforms, AI services. Um, I wrote about this in 2005, 2006. Um, Amazon, AWS, their second ever book, as in their own book, uh, as far as I understand, Jonathan and Tom's blood, they've got 17 pages of mapping, including the ILC model. So you can guess who uses it to tear up industry after industry. Okay. So what I mentioned this, well, when you look at a map, and this happens to be um, uh, to do with uh, driving us, the automotive industry, it was a map uh, produced in 2015, rolled forward to 2025. And it was looking at changes of the industry. One of the things uh, when you look at this is that different nations play different games with these maps. Uh, I won't go through. I'm just mindful of the time. I don't want to overrun. But when it comes to territorial spaces, when we talk about territorial sovereignty, we always describe in terms of map where our borders are, where we cooperate, where we collaborate, where we conflict with others. They're all different forms of competition. But we don't do it with economic systems, mostly because we don't have landscapes. We don't have a map. So we can't determine where our borders are. And why does it matter? I'll just sh shoot a few slides across because China is very good at playing the strategic game as well, has been for, for years. But if I look at this map, um, this particular value chain of uh, the automotive industry is part of the national collective of industries. And nations have values which we embed in simulation models, which are embedded in time, inside the uh, AIs, which are used to train these particular systems. Uh, and this is 
for example, the trolley problem. Do you kill three people or one people? Well, the answer depends on your collective. If you're a Confucius nation, you just kill uh, uh, the one person. Uh, but if you're a capitalist nation, you might say the one person's a billionaire, the three people are unemployed, kill the three. It depends on the, what you value in your society. The point about this is we have lots of conversations about territorial sovereignty, fair enough, but territorial is only one of many forms, political, economic, uh, digital. You've probably have heard a lot of people talking about the digital supply chain. Um, they, these are all issues of sovereignty. Um, and our, our largest issue is that we don't look at the landscape, except for in the territorial space. We don't have maps, so we can't say where our borders are. We can't say where we should co op cooperate, collaborate, and conflict with others. Um, and so the one question I would leave you is, uh, where are your maps, radars, and situation rooms for the national supply chain? Not just across physical supply chains. We're pretty poor in that space across agriculture, uh, energy, um, I've got to say against healthcare, um, uh, manufacturing, construction, um, but also within the software industry as well. We've, se we've seen some positive uh, software bill of materials, but you know that's uh, spoms. But that's only just a very early start. That doesn't give you a map. Anyway, I have now definitely overrun my time, so I will stop. Simon, <laughs> I'm sorry to shoot through that at the end. <laughs> thank you so much. And to be honest, just based on the comments that we have here in the chat, it would have caused an uproar if we would have got you before you got to finish your speech. So thank oh. you for finishing. Oh. And we were oh, all did, gathered did around enjoy? watching. Yes. So. <laughs> yes, the comments are here saying that we could have listened to like 60 to 90 minutes more of you. So thank oh. you. Well, just invite me back and just give me more. <laughs> We'd love to. <laughs> yes. So much interesting stuff going on at the moment. But um, yep. anyway, pleasure. And thank you ever so much. Yes. We're going to take one question, I believe. Delight. Yes. Oh, okay. There's one question. Zilla already is asking in, asking in the chat. Just wondering, when you do a map like this within a company, who, who needs to yep. participate? Especially when you make suggestions of leaving the self-build track and use off-the-shelf instead. Oh, so so that's a that's a fascinating one. Um, so I, I do um, I, I get these lovely emails from uh, these companies who are um, now billion market cap companies, and, and they send me these emails saying we built our business using your maps. Thank you so much. So I know there are lots of companies using it, uh, or certain companies using it in the boardroom. And then I get uh, um, uh, wonderful emails, truly wonderful emails. Well, for example, the sexual health campaign, small organizations, uh, uh, NGOs uh, using it to basically improve sexual health in, in different nations. And it's just like fantastic, making people more aware. Um, so the answer is um, it, it, I, I also have people who view map themselves. Uh, and as a result, change change their careers, their their jobs, uh, and what they're what they're doing. So um, you can use it pretty much at any layer. Um, remember, a map doesn't tell you what to do. All it's doing is it showing you a representation of a landscape to, onto which you have to apply thought. So the, the the danger with maps are people try and make a perfect map, but you can't. All right, it's just not possible. Uh, you can only make a good enough one, and that's what you should aim for. Something that's useful enables me to have that dialogue, that conversation. It's like that Negroponte uh, article about the conversation between human and machine. You know, we need the medium in which to do this. Um, so um, they're not perfect. And they also don't tell you what to do. That bit you, <laughs> is the conversation. That's where the thought comes into play. Uh, but you can use it at a low level, um, uh, on an individual project. You can use it on yourself. You can use it at nation states. You can use it for a company. So the answer to your question is where should you start is it doesn't matter just as long as you start. Yeah. And that's the difficult bit. <laughs> Absolutely. That's right. right. Once again, thank you so much, Simon. Pleasure. Lordly. Simon. It's been amazing, and uh, the audience has thank clearly you. loved it. Yes. And uh, hope to see you again. Oh, absolute pleasure, and thank okay. you. Hi, we're from Epico, the proud organizer of the DevOps Conference. 
Our goal is to uncover cutting-edge talks, emerging ideas, and DevOps trends, providing a global forum for practitioners and decision-makers to learn and grow. We would love to also explore how we can help you excel in DevOps together. Visit us at effigo.com and enjoy the inspiring talks at the DevOps conference. <laughs>